You are listening to the voice of Kurdish American Radio for democracy, peace, and freedom. Ms. Roya Hakakian is one of those authors whose work leaves a lasting impression on her readers. Her sensitivity to the complexities of life, her poetic writing style, and impeccable investigative journalism makes her work unforgettable. Few authors are able to bring atrocities to life without wallowing in the darkness. She gives us hope while asking us to face the unpleasant realities of our world. Ms. Hakakian's most recent book is titled The Assassins of the Turquoise Palace. This book is the non-fiction account of the 1992 Mykonos restaurant assassinations in Berlin. On a recent visit to Los Angeles, we sat down with Ms. Hakakian to discuss her extraordinary work. Why did you choose this particular case mm -hmm. um, versus, for example, assassinations that have happened before or since? It has a happy ending. You know, I... I didn't want to just deal with tragedy. Um, there are en enough sad stories, um, and I wasn't interested in, a, in tragedy for the sake of tragedy. I wanted, uh, I wanted a happy ending. I wanted this story with lots of surprises and unexpected twists and turns, and this had all of them. So um, from a purely plot perspective it was a perfect plot and you know um, in a way it's a story that that didn't go according anybody's plan you know um, the victims and the survivors had expected it to end differently I mean they, they had all expected it to go the way that you know the Iranian regime um, seems to always uh, achieve uh, then the perpetrators were certain that they would get off, you know, and so what I loved about it is that it, it was a surprise to everyone on both sides and it just went in its own direction and I thought, what a great story. That's great. How did you navigate, like, being able to hold such burden, you know, because mm -hmm. you, um, all these characters depend on you to be able to tell this story to the world. Mm -hmm. Um, well, there's there's one thing that I have to correct, which is that the story had already happened and ended, and I was showing up on the scene years later. Um, I wish I had been there when, you know, when the trial was um, in, on the way and uh, and things were occurring. But I got there way after it was all over. In a way, um, I was a, I was bearing a, bearing witness, but uh, but I also wasn't because it was after fact that I got onto the scene. However, you're right because you know, for example, I sat down with the daughter of Nuri Dehkordi, and I think either I was the first person with whom she had agreed to talk, or I was one of the first people with whom she was talking, and I know it was really difficult. Um, Sarah. Yes, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I talked to Parviz's daughter, and uh, you know, she wept in front of the ca uh, in front of me, and uh, same thing for a lot of others. Um, I could the my only consolation was that if this becomes a, a really really good book, a book that um, you know does well, a book that people read widely then what they have entrusted me will pay off. That I will be not just a witness, but a worthy witness. Because I think part of why the story, the, you know, their pain is still so raw is because there has never been a proper ending to this. In that, even though there was a trial, even though uh, this particular case got a lot of attention, um, it's still a story that by and large has remained unknown and uh, and I think if the book, if a book um, does well by by its characters and you know if, if the writer does her job properly and bears with witness properly so that the story can become um, one that people read widely and sympathize with and empathize with then maybe it has all been worth it. Uh, one of the things that I hope it does 
is that it shows that we don't have to shy away from such tragedies because they make us look bad. Um, because I think one can look at tragedy um, from an original perspective and cast it in such a way that it's not shameful. And I think perhaps it's something that I've managed to do here, that you know, I've taken a tragedy and a story that we shy away from because it's sad and it's shameful and, and have recast it in a way that we can now own it and say, this is us, look at us. And I think it's, uh, it's actually, in my view, one of the very foundations that makes for a successful movement, you know, for liberation, for democracy, for whatever else you want to call it, that you can't be ashamed of your history. You can't be ashamed of your past. And you have to own, um, you know, the things that you, that have, you have been told make you look bad or ashamed. So in a way, it's an attempt at trying to own the things that we think we have to shy away from. I think we don't have to. I think if we just turn them upside down and look at them from a different angle, they are the very things that should make us proud. And so, in a way, I think complicated characters, complex personalities, are products of tyrannies. You know, we're not straightforward. We're not you know, we're not good, we're not bad. Um, we've had to cope with really difficult circumstances. And, you know, we cheat and we lie. Um, and we become little crooks. Um, but we have always been told and we have accepted it that the end justifies the means. And that we have been lonely and and victimized and victims and therefore in order to survive and get on we've we've done things that we're not proud of but we've done them but it's all been because we have all along been suffering so uh, one of the things that in fact I wanted to do was to present this complexity and say I want to tell you a story that doesn't have one character get used to it I'm going to tell you a story in which there are no black and white people, in which there are people who do good and bad, but they all do it because of reasons that you can appreciate. You know, you may disagree with them, but you can see why they've done the things that they've done. Um, it took me more than a year to learn the case, you know, to master the characters, to learn the story, because, you know, there was also about a year's preparation on the part of Tehran uh, that went into it. So really the story begins, if, if I were to really, really, really just do a historical book, I would have to start in 1991 when they start sending businessmen um, into Germany um, who would then um, uh, set up the scene, set up, you know, prepare um, the grounds for the operation. So um, it, it, it starts then, and, and it took me a very long time to just learn the facts. Uh, so, you know, in my office I had a whole wall dedicated to chronology. You know, starts 1991, I had like index cards, like flowchart that, you know, just followed year by year. I still have, like, a huge timeline. It's a, it's a mini book on its own that just, you know, summarizes the chronology of what happened. And then I had a, I had a, on the other wall, I had a sort of a family tree of who was who and how everybody was related to everybody. So there was a family tree of, of the Germans and then the, you know, the Kurds and then the perpetrators and then the Iranian survivors and so on and so forth. So it took me a very long so it time. Was, and it was interesting to me, how did you navigate the various languages? Because the, the court was done in mm -hmm. German, the, you know, some of the more um, 
pronounced characters are German, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and um, then there are Iranians, right. and there are Kurds, and there right. are, you know, and, y- and yet you wrote this in English, right. so that mm-hmm. was just astounding to me, I was like, how was she able to, what was lost in translation, and what were you able to, how were you able to bring out in a story in English that was told in various, various other languages? Fortunately, the, all the documents having to do with the case had already been translated into Persian um, by people who had been really invested and um, been involved in the process and had produced books about it. So uh, the documents already existed in Persian, which was no problem. That left only the German uh, side. And I often talk to them in the presence of a Persian speaker so that a lot of it I could understand but it, but I always felt better if there was a Persian speaker who told who you know told me whatever that it was that I might have been missing uh, all in all I, I wish my German were better I wish I did not need a translator um, but 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 I think it worked out fine in that um, I think there was some, some perhaps in some ways, uh, they thought that you know, having an outsider, a pair of ears that was coming from the other side of the oceans uh, was something fresh for them. And so they, they were opening up after a long time to people they had never spoken to, you know, to someone that they had never spoken to because um, they had seen each other, you know, they had been interviewed by each other and there were a lot of German journalists who had already interviewed, say, the prosecutor. And I think being sort of a fresh face um, possibly gave them an excuse to say certain things that they had not spoken about. I think the greatest advantage was that was was a great disadvantage, which was also a great disadvantage, was that it it had happened and it was in the past and it was finished. And there was nothing at stake anymore. You know, they didn't feel that if they said something, they could change the destiny of the trial. Um, and I think that kind of liberated them to feel that now that there's nothing at stake, you know, they cannot influence the process in any way. They can just say what they feel. Mm-hmm. And I think, um, especially with Bruno Yos, the prosecutor, that, that certainly was the case. Um, additionally, because the last interview he gave me, he gave me after he had already retired. Um, so, the story becomes... Uh, of universal worth if your reader feels that you're just laying down the facts and letting them he or she decide what to take away and I think that the reader will trust you as a narrator if the reader believes that you you have been fair and you have Um, given them uh, all the tools they need in order to make their own judgment. And my intention was to do just that, to give them uh, all the tools that they would need in order to make a judgment. And and the ultimate judgment, in my view, and that the real perpetrators are the people who didn't carry out the actual physical attack. The real perpetrators were in Tehran. And I think that's what I wanted people to take away from it. One of the most effective scenes in the story to me is the actual scene of the assassination. Um, It was really just visual and I felt that it would make a perfect film. Do you have plans to talk to producers and directors who might Mm -hmm. work with you? There have been uh, several who have approached me and I have have talked to them. Mm, We'll see. I hope something comes out. Okay. Yeah. Do you plan to continue political work or, I mean, political writings, or is this it for you? I don't know. I, definitely, I, uh, my next one won't be similar. I think um, I have a, 
political temperament. Uh, I have um, sort of a mind that um, sees things in terms of social justice and uh, and you know from the perspective of you know what has happened in the past 30 years and you know and and those lights and I think no matter what I do somehow it will uh, have that sort of an angle but assassinations I think I'm done with for a while <laughs> okay. yeah. well thank you so much for agreeing to do this I would really be honored if you would of course. thank you sure. You are listening to the voice of Kurdish American Radio for democracy, peace, and freedom.